author is an incredibly powerful seat to sit in. It's so powerful, it's dangerous because an author can write any story they want. So be careful. Be careful what you write. So, Kirk, you wrote an article recently around the, the power of story and how it impacts leaders and, and what they do. So uh, you're going to read that article for us and then we'll kind of break it down and use that as an anchor point for our conversation today. Yeah, I, I was writing this piece because I wanted to share a poem written by Portia Nelson, but I wanted to give it some context. Humans live stories. We love facts and we use them to improve our stories, but in the end, we live inside the stories that we tell. The stories we tell are nothing more than the way we attach meaning to the things in our lives. Now, stick with me for a minute and allow me to explain. There are two ways that we understand the world in which we live. First, the world is a place of things. There is a materiality to it. We can discover things with our five senses. We use science to study those things. We build and create with these things. They are the ingredients that we use to shape our lives, but by themselves, they are just things. They are what flour is to cake. And who wants to eat flour when you can have cake? <laughs> but creating a cake takes action and intent. And from this, we learn the world is also an arena for action. It's full of motion, choice, freedom, risk, results. It's experienced. And all actions are driven by motive, belief, meaning, which are just three ways of saying stories. The stories we tell are nothing more than the meaning we attach to the things in our lives. Or the stories we tell are what we believe about the things in the world. Here's the point. The most significant, powerful, impactful, long-lasting, generous, loving, positive thing we can do to improve the results that we are experiencing is learn to improve the stories in which we live. You see, we don't live in a world of things. We live in the stories we tell about the world of things because humans live stories. So in this episode, I want to tell this short story written by Portia Nelson. It's about a person on a journey trying to reach a goal, probably just like you and me. It could be a goal like grow your business or maybe start a business. But our hero keeps running into an obstacle. As I read this, listen for the change our hero makes to the stories that they're living in. The story is called, There's a Hole in the Sidewalk. Chapter 1. I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes me a very long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it, it's there. I still fall in, it's a habit. My eyes are open, I know where I am. It is my fault, I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down another street. Love that. So, so why this today? I mean, you, you spent time writing that. We know that a, a key anchor point to our work at Icon Coaching is around story work because we find often the things that are uh, barriers or limitations to the, the goals or the desires that our clients are really seeking uh, tend to be connected to uh, stories that they're telling themselves that maybe are no longer helpful or have never been helpful. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find a way to, to get a better story 
that leads them to better outcomes or more helpful outcomes. But but why today read that? What, what's your thought behind this episode and what we want to talk about? Yeah, I think the big idea for this episode that I want people to hear and walk away with um, is that we want to go deeper into this notion of intrinsic motivation. We talk a lot, and you've heard us say a lot, that there's extrinsic motivations and intrinsic motivations and some of how that works and and how in modern work, the external motivators, they, they're brilliant at times, but they're actually sometimes unhelpful. And we really want to learn how to lead from and implement from and actually, as, as leaders um, live from this thing we call intrinsic motivation. But it's a pretty complex subject. It's a little difficult to figure out what am I intrinsically motivated by? And I think sometimes we we do find it. We, we're like, oh yeah, I really really want to do X, and it's from a it's from a deep intrinsic place, and it feels maybe even like it's our identity. And but but we're not able yet to see that it's a story that we're telling. Um, and when we can get to stories and understand how stories work, which we'll break down in this episode to some degree, we're able to then evaluate. Yeah, I might be intrinsically motivated. That motive might be coming from inside me. But I could improve that. I could upgrade it. I could change that. And I could actually find a, maybe we'll say deeper or better story to tell that would release something about me that is more true about me. Um, and I think it's easy to just fall back on, well, this is who I am. And what you see is what you get. And this is how I do the world. And that's that. And it's like, yeah, but so much of what's embedded in that is your current understanding of how the world works or how you work in the world. And can you see the components of that that are a story? Yeah. I think even in that poem that Portia writes and is connected to the language of story is we have these two uh, components, these two roles that are a character and an author. Yeah. And so what you see early on in her poem is you see a character. Mm -hmm. the character is walking and it's, it's no, no control. Everything's happening to them. And all the fault is everyone else, no responsibility. By the end, there's the same person, but they're no longer a character. They're actually authoring mm -hmm. a whole different route. They're traveling a new road. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk about in our story work, we talk about the need to understand the difference between even character and author. Talk a little bit about that. I know we can go into a whole episode there. Sure. But I think you have to recognize that if we're going to do story work, it's not really the character that gets to do that yeah. as much as we have to show up. As the author. Yeah. Yeah. So we live stories. I think that we're, we're navigating our world inside of a story of who we are and how we function and what things mean, like I said in the piece. But, but we often, when we feel stuck or lost or unable to change the circumstances of our life, powerless, um, mm -hmm. it's because we're running this, we're, we're stuck inside of a story and we don't understand that we are both the character in that story. And I think that's true. We are a character in these stories, but we're also the author of it. And it's the author that can see it as a story. A character cannot see it. They. Harry Potter is stuck inside of a story that J.K. Rollins wrote, and he can't do anything else. But J.K. Rollins can do anything with Harry Potter, right? Yeah. And we want to get people into a spot where they can recognize that they are authoring their stories. And yes, they've had help. There's other people involved. We have It's like the bibliography or, or the, right. the sources from which we draw. But we're using those sources to create our experiences. Um, and if we can get ourselves into author position, you can do something about it. So in Portia's story, this person keeps falling in the hole. The hole is actually there. Like somebody dug a hole in the sidewalk. Yeah. Like that person's probably either a dirt bag or a construction worker that doesn't know about barricades, <laughs> right. right? But regardless yeah. of that, there's a hole in the sidewalk. That is a fact. They're falling into it and then saying it's not my fault. And then they even pretend it's not there and they still fall in it. And it's the point at which they're like, wait a minute. I knew there was a hole there. Yeah. I fell in it. I can do something. I can it. do something. That's the author talking, like you right. were saying. And by the and then as we go from chapter three to four to five, they author their self not only around the hole, but it finally dawns on them that there's another street. There's yeah. another route to get to the goal. So in this character author notion, I often describe it as again as a metaphor of how we're now following GPS to get everywhere. If you don't know where you're going, you plug it into your map and a blue line emerges, right? At least in the in the Google. You get this blue that's line. That's right. And you just follow the blue line. You don't have to think anymore. Just follow the blue line. And I think that's the character 
who is just following the blue line through life. And it's fine. Um, but sometimes we think we want to make change. We want to do something different or get a different result. And so we deviate from the blue line. We're like, ah, I'm going to get you. And instead of turning right, we turn left. Yeah. But sure enough, we end up back on the blue line and it's rerouted us back to the exact same result because characters can't pick new destinations. They just follow the blue line. But as an author, we can go in and go, wait a minute. All right, buddy, quit, quit trying yeah. to get off the blue line. It's your job to stay on it. But as an author, you can go in and you can change the destination. You can go, I don't want to go there anymore. I now want to go there and a new route will emerge and you write a new story for the character. And then guess what? They just follow the blue line again. It's that notion of understanding that there are these dual roles and you got to make sure you're sitting in the position of author to do story work because the character just does what the right. character is told to do. Yeah, exactly. So let's break it down into some practical ways. So okay. we're talking concepts. I think most people uh, have heard this. We're not the first to talk about Good this. Lord, it's, no. it's currently, you <laughs> yeah. know, kind of a, an active yeah. uh, thought that's out there. But what does that look like when you're coaching somebody or like, you know, how I might coach a client? How does this show up? It's some of the first couple of sessions that we do with clients because it's so important Yeah, because it is a destination piece yeah. and we're not trying to just change uh, patterns and routes. We're actually trying to get people to recognize maybe the destination they've, you know, written needs to be changed altogether tied to even what they want intrinsically based on what they should want and all those comparisons. So there's a lot of work there, but what does that look like in a client? Like what are, what are some of the things that hold them up that are connected to story? Yeah. We don't use, you know, right or wrong language. We don't use true or not true. We, we use language around helpful, not helpful because we think that is helpful <laughs> in the process, but <laughs> Yeah. Get, get me into your okay. into your room with the client. What does that kind of look like? So I was working with a guy uh, quite a long time ago, and he, he it just is a good example of what you're talking about, where he had grown a team and he was learning how to lead them well. And it turns out sometimes as a leader, you have to make decisions that people don't like. It impacts them. It takes away, like laying somebody off or firing sure. somebody or, or, or changing a whole department so that three jobs go away, but three new ones come. And I mean, these are big deals to people. And as a leader, those are things you actually have to do. And so he was getting feedback when he would do things like that, that you're mean, you're, you're just in it for the money. You don't care about us, stuff like that. And it triggered this thing inside of him where he started to talk about, I feel like I'm just being a monster. I'm just a monster. I don't want to be a monster. And I'm like, wait, so you think when you have to make a significant change of the business that causes hardship for people, that makes you a monster. And, he, and we didn't, it took a while for, to bring this out, but that was the root story. Sure. When I do something that people don't like and they tell me they don't like it, that's evidence that I'm a monster. And I was like, or it's evidence that you're an amazing leader. And I like my story better <laughs> because that's a story on display. He pre-thought he was a monster. And when people did anything that pinged that, it just made him, it just confirmed it. Right. So then he wouldn't do things to make sure he never got that response. And it was actually having doing damage to the business. Yeah. So when the facts were, when I received negative feedback that is in the, in the, topic or the theme of you're mean, you're selfish, you're in it for the money, then for me, that means I'm a monster. I'm going to give meaning to that rather than turn it into, no, that's actually a different storyline. Yeah. The, the event or the fact or the thing that the, the hole in the sidewalk. So the yeah. thing that actually is there is you, a hard decision that caused hardship for somebody. Yeah. That's a thing. The meaning he attached was I'm a monster. When I retold him that story is, no, 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 you're a great leader. That's what great leaders do. Um, like that's just, yeah. which one's more helpful becomes the question. Yeah. Right. Because, because when you show up in a better version of that, you actually feel different emotions. Mm -hmm. And we do know those emotions lead to 
actions. And so if they're better emotions, mm -hmm. they're going to lead to better or more helpful behaviors that lead us to the things we actually want rather than shrinking back or avoiding or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all the, all the negative things that might happen as a result of that. I had a client who I was working with and they are a highly technical professional in their industry. Like they're one of the senior tech people in their industry and uh, doing this work realized that there was a story that they were telling themselves that was limiting them in how they might emerge to the next level of leadership, parenting, you know, uh, just some of the some of the goals that they've had. This one was going to be connected to really reaching those. It was like a barrier hanging over. And, and I, I, I also couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, it took me quite a bit of listening. But what what the triggering moment was is they would have conversations with their spouse around money. Hmm. And whenever this conversation would occur, which, you know, anyone who's married, you have lots of conversations <laughs> about money. But but this conversation would trigger them to to hide, avoid, to quit, to bail, to close off. And they, they knew that this wasn't helpful. They, they always knew that this isn't what they wanted, but it became a barrier. And so what, what I realized in that situation and talking to them is they felt that they were dumb. Mm. So the story that was being told there in, in their own way of discovering it was when I don't know all of the information, which this person felt they didn't know enough about money and their partner did. So when they show up in those conversations, they feel small, they feel ignorant. So basically, if I don't know everything about something, I am dumb. That was the story. Well, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, is that really true? And is that playing out into all of life? So you're only smart when you have the knowledge edge than everyone else in the room. And are you really gonna live your life that small with this expectation that unless you have perfect knowledge, you'll never be smart? No. We're going to find a better story that yeah. says, actually, I'm a smart person and I don't need to know everything. In fact, I can be a learner by showing up in situations where I don't know everything by asking questions and growing in my knowledge. Right. That's a better story right. that now allows them to show up rather than hide, close off and, and not attain the thing that they know they really want deep inside. When you're working with... Um with leaders, leaders are primarily doing human work or conceptual work. They're not doing as many tasks as they once did. Now, task is a form of work that is easy to see. You can, I mean, it's it's the, the results are self-evident, and it's very, 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 very important work. Sometimes it's it's beyond mission critical. Like it's the thing we do is this task. But to build teams that can get that all done, you're doing what we what we think of as human work. And inside of human work, these stories, the way we tell stories, is in my mind, one of the most critical things to understand to be able to lead people well. First, you got to understand your own stories. Right. How are those operating and impacting what you're doing? If you're walking around as a leader thinking if you don't know everything, you're dumb, that's going to, that is going to have a negative right. impact. Not helpful. I worked with another leader who believed no matter what I do, everything's just going to fall apart anyway. Yeah. So yeah. why invest? Why try? Why like... It's almost a nothing matters sort of framework. Yeah. We discovered where that came from, and he had a very good reason to believe that. It just wasn't true in his life anymore, and we needed to upgrade that to, actually, if I apply myself, good things can happen. Right. Way better story for a leader running a business. You also, as you start to see how your own stories are working, you can start to recognize them in others. And you can start to go, oh, we keep having this repeating problem on this team because these people are telling this particular story. If we could upgrade that from one of, of maybe a negative fear-based story, like, gosh, the, the economy's falling apart. That's a, you know, or interest rates are rising, or it's about inflation. Well, we don't actually have any control of that. We can notice that that's a thing. But what we can also do is recognize that we have a unique position in the marketplace. And if we might have to try harder right now, but we might actually be the company that comes out on top in yeah, this. Exactly. But we have to apply ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just sitting around going, ah, the sky is falling. You know, maybe, 
but that's not very helpful. <laughs> no, it's not very helpful. You know, and some of this taps really deep areas that go all the way back to childhood. And, and sometimes we'll even refer a client in those moments, they might need to do some therapy work. Mm -hmm. But what I've, what I've found is trying to clarify this because story work can go one of two ways. People can say, oh, it's too conceptual. It's too whatever. I'm just going to ignore it. It's not that big of a deal, which isn't helpful. We know that. But then some people can lean to them be, beginning to overanalyze it. And everything's a story. Everyone has a story and it's all connected to story. And it's like, that's too far too. So I found in working with people that, you know, what, what might be a thing that's a barrier to you that feels like it's limiting you, it's getting in the way, it's an, it's an obstacle, you keep repeating this cycle that is uh, not allowing you to get to the next thing you know is awaiting you, this, this dream, this desire. And usually if we start there, we can, we can backtrack it to probably the, the story that needs to be rewritten, yep. a better version. Because you know, not every story was bad. It might have been helpful at a time. Yeah. But, but now it's no longer helpful because what was true is no longer true, right? So yeah. we're, just, we're always kind of have to work at that. Totally. There's a, you know, the, there's a famous line that says, what got you here won't necessarily get you there. Right. And that can be strategy and skill-based stuff, but it can also be stories that we tell. And we actually say stories come in three forms. There are stories that are awesome. You want to understand that they're awesome and you want to see them as stories and tell them. They can become lore and mythology within a company. They're fantastic. And you want to tell them over and over and over again. There are stories that used to be awesome but aren't anymore. Those are the ones that you want to upgrade. It requires real work, sometimes at the level of culture, to actually do the work say, yes, we used to do things that way, but because we're now trying to right. get there, we don't anymore. Um and then there are stories that were never helpful. They were just never were. And we have those on board too. Often those ones are the ones that you're talking about that are deeper connected to childhood issues or things like that, that we do, um, we work with therapists to help that stuff. Um, but the idea that there is a, there's a story right now that people want, <laughs> we'll say it this way, people come into our office because they're feeling a pain or a problem or have a goal that they can't quite attain or something like something's going on and usually what's going on is they're trying to make it through some kind of transition and the place we start is all right what stories are you telling that are limiting you from making the transition because right. um, it's not a fact that that is in the way it's not an event or a thing in the world it's what you think it means right i was talking to one guy a couple of weeks ago and it's like if i hire more teams, if I grow my, it's a service business, if I grow my business and hire more teams, then my quality is going to go down, the messes and complication is going to go up, and all I'm going to do is scale a mess. And I'm like, yes, if the definition of quality is you did the work. But there's all kinds of companies out there doing all kinds of work that's of very high quality. So maybe what we need to do is be the kind of person who can train and Maybe right now we're not that kind of person, Sure, but let's figure it out. Yeah, it's right? really good. It's just a different story. It's, it's a different mode of showing up versus just going, no, it'll never work because I'm just going to, quality will go down and it's a foregone conclusion. I'm like, well, yeah, if you keep telling that story, that's exactly yeah, what's going to exactly. happen. So yeah. let's not grow because what you have right now is awesome. Or you could change your story. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And I, I love the fact that we have to do the work to separate the, yeah. the attachment of facts and then this story that really is separate we tend to we tend to put them together well the character if, can only do that right yeah, that's exactly. the character's view that this is reality right so what we're trying to do is go hey maybe take a moment separate that especially if if you're a leader right now where you might be feeling uh you know emotions that are tied to your hiding you're avoiding um, there is this negative sense of um, I've gone as far as I can. The best days are behind me. I mean, they, they're just a million of them, right? They show up all the time. And to be quite honest, I, I still do this work Yeah. because consistently, you know, if, if you're a growing leader, it's like welcome to the, welcome to this whole game that we play. And it's yeah. called you're confronting issues. You're confronting real things because you're, you're gaining new territory you've never been before. So fears emerge, unknowns emerge. 
and doing this work becomes really helpful. And when you, when you realize you have feelings around something that are not helpful to you, they're shame-based, fear-based or whatever, we do, we do a thing that's helpful, and this might be helpful for people listening in, is we begin to ask the why. We do the why shovel into that. Yeah. So, okay, I'm hiding. Why? I'm avoiding. Why? I'm frustrating. Right. Whatever. Yeah, I'm frustrated. Yeah. So you go, why? And then you, you write it down. Yeah. Why, why am I hiding? Okay, I'm hiding because. And you say, I'm hiding because I'm, I'm aware that there's something going on that I don't want anyone to know about. Why? Okay. Boom. And you get what ends up happening is you get seven or eight whys in mm -hmm. and you usually get to a real root story. Yeah. And that becomes really helpful. And now leaning into the better version of that, because if you can see clearly what the unhelpful version is, it's really easy to seed a, a new, better version. Yeah. Yeah. This exercise you're, you're describing, um, as they walk down through this and they keep asking themselves, why, why, why? When we're doing this live with people, and I think you can do this yourself, um, you can start to listen for certain types of words that show up. And they are clear evidence that you've got story merged, that you're telling a story. It's things as simple as the word to, T-O-O. -O. You know, why am I depressed? Because I'm too busy. Well, no, the fact is you're busy. The two is the story. Sure. How do we know you're too busy? Or you'll, I'm too fat. Hmm. There's a whole, that's a lot of story going on. Um, your weight is the fact, whatever the weight is. So let's say you're 300 pounds and, and you think your ideal weight is 180. Right. All right. Well, but what if you want to be a sumo wrestler? At 300, you're too skinny. You got a serious problem, right? right? I'm yeah. too short. You're 5'2 and, and, and you wish you were six foot. Okay. Well, but again, if you're trying to be a jockey, you're too tall. Right. So it's just yeah. the word to reveals a story. Another big one is um, the word should. Well, I should weigh 180. Oh, really? Who told you that? Well, some chart on the wall in the doctor's office. Well, uh, if you want to be in the NFL, I don't think you should weigh 180. So the word should is somebody else's voice, some a value that somebody else has placed on you. It's not your voice yet. If you say, I want to weigh 180, great, we can work with that. But should is a value statement that's not a fact. It's a story being told. Um, you can almost hear people, you'll, you'll bleed other people's voices in. Well, my dad said, or so-and-so, or my boss. And you're starting to pull feedback into it. Now, I don't want to diminish the value of feedback. But when you're trying to find your author's voice, it's only your voice. This is what I say about this. Um, so that's another way that you can do, do this. And you can start to hear the stories being told. Yeah. Um, my favorite one to play with, I played with a few times, is wait. Let's, and it's just a good example. Someone says um, they're 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 trying to describe something, and they say, "I want to lose weight." Well, that's that's not a statement of now, right? We're not getting to an author would go, "No, no, no what's the current state of events right now?" Oh, okay, I'm overweight. Okay, well. What does that mean? Right. I don't know what that, there's no clarity to that yet. We're not getting to the bottom of anything. Um, I, I wish I weighed a hundred pounds. I wish I weighed less. Nope. Same thing. Just inverted. Okay. At this point, I don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. We're still hiding from it because I don't know if you're a hundred pounds overweight, 30 pounds overweight, or actually anorexic. Cause all three of those people can say I'm overweight. But the story embedded in it hasn't been revealed. And so you dig down. And when you can start to say, I weigh 150 pounds and, and, and I have been, I tell myself a story about that, that that's too heavy. And, because, and then why? Why is that too heavy? Well, and then you start to hear the other voices emerge, right? Well, my mom said this and this and this. And, and you start to hear their critiques. And you get finally down to your voice somewhere in there. And you'll start to hear how you're telling the story about the fact that you weigh 150 pounds. The result I typically feel is it's like you're saying, it's not this burden when you're actually being, and it's probably radical self-honesty. Like it's yeah. not just Thursday afternoon with buddies, honesty. It's like radical self-honesty and a willing to see what actually is. There's a willingness involved that has to be at play here. And as you drop down in there, 
you might find that your whole, like you might end up, like you said, doing the exact same thing you've been doing, but from a completely different meaning structure. Or sometimes you actually start doing something entirely different. But either way, there's a sense of power that you start to have in the world. You're no longer under this thing. And it's still what, what you're facing might be really hard. It might still be heavy, but it's not a burden. And you're willing now to lift it because it matters and it means something to you. And that's, we call that empowerment or the idea of powering up or leveling up your, your internal structure. And then this hard thing that you've been avoiding, it's like, oh, but that's worth it. I'll, I'll totally do that because now it's in my voice. I want to, and it's just different. One of the other ways to figure, to, to know that you need to do this work is when you have a repeating problem. No matter what you do, you keep ending up with the same result. You've tried this, you try this, you try this. And it's because the, the available set of solutions you're working with are not all of them. It's just the story you're telling is that's all of them. And what you have to do there is you have to be willing to go into things that are off limits. You have to go look in places. We will call this blind spots, but it's deeper than that. It's like taboos. It's like we're not allowed to go there. But when you have a repeating problem and you can't find your way out of it, it's time to go look in the taboos. Places you were told are off limits, out of touch, wrong. Like it's a moral feeling sometimes. But if that's where the solution is, it is moral to go there and find it. Um, very often with clients, in order to help them go there, I'll, I'll go stand in their blind spot and talk to them from there. And they're like, what are you, like, they can't understand what I'm talking about. What do you mean by that? What? Because they're not allowed to actually think in that, in that, into that space. But if you, if you let them start to go there and you'll bring them into that, they'll discover there's a set of solutions over there. And the story they were telling is, well, that's not allowed. Yeah. I'm like, you know what's not allowed though? It's being stuck. Right. Yeah. So let's go after it. Yeah. And you can run it as an experiment. If it doesn't, it wasn't a helpful story, <laughs> but take the risk to write a different story. Author is an incredibly powerful seat to sit in. It's so powerful, it's dangerous because an author can write any story they want. So be careful. Be careful what you write.